Stop, you're listening to Rain It In with Ash and Dash. Well, I can actually quickly look and say, well, so we can actually get this right for once. I think it's eight. I think it is eight. I think it's eight. We'll just conf- let's go for eight. <laughs> we'll double down and say this is eight. Let's double down and go for eight. Welcome back to episode eight of the Rain It In podcast. Um, and we've got a very special guest with us today, um, which we're very excited to have this conversation on where it's going. Um, I will try my best input with my uh, limited... I'm going to get comfy. I'm going to take the sliders off. Um, with my limited um, equestrian knowledge um, and chime in where I can and then Josh can guide me throughout the way. Um, now, usually we'll have a big round of applause, but there's like usually there's five of us behind the camera that actually end up watching this and they sit and it's big... Uh, Gravitas, it's really empowering. So in a second, so she's going to give her best, uh, best efforts on her own. Uh, go on, introduction. Okay, girl. yeah, I've got. Of course, I have. I was very organised for this podcast. Love that. So today we welcome Henry Carter, owner of Optimal Equestrian Performance. He has a diploma in sport development, coaching, and fitness, and a BA in sports and exercise science, MSc in strength and conditioning. And he's a certified personal trainer that is now specialising in strength training and rider fitness for the equestrian industry. Can you say exercise one, one more time for me? Exercise. Yeah, I just wanted to know. We all heard you say exercise. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Henry Carter. <laughs> Look at that, that's amazing. Henry, thanks for coming on, buddy. No, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, for having me on the show. No, no, no. Honestly, it's ours. Like getting, getting the time to sit down with people like yourself and just have open conversation is is actually more like therapy for me so <laughs> you're doing me a favor but um i think it, especially what we've established with this podcast though we we sort of go between like equestrianism but also mainstream mainly with the equestrian people that we have on i think it's really nice that um people can come on and have a really open and honest conversation about what they do in the industry, what the industry's like. There's not really a platform. It's a real positive plug. There's not really a platform like this where we go, we don't care about the stereotypes in the industry and let's just have a frank and honest conversation about it. Um, so yeah, let, uh, thank you very much for coming on, buddy. Yeah, man, really appreciate it. But before we go into too much detail, just something that I wanted to cover. Um, so prior to... A week ago, it must, it must have been, I received a phone call from a number I didn't recognize and it happened to be Henry. And that led me to look into what he was doing. We then actually had a meeting the following day. I won't go into details what we were discussing, but I've then since sort of started doing a lot with the Half Step social media channel. Um, and I saw that you'd actually cold message the Half Step social media page as well and I want to give you full credit for that was in February uh, you then still managed to find my number and call me and still reaching out and I was like well you're a police database Henry that's what we really <laughs> want to know but um, no the fact that you sort of reached out the way that you did the way that you came across the way that you spoke to me I was like instantly I felt a connection towards you and obviously that led us to now being sat here and wanting uh, doing this podcast together um, and I could really relate to having to reach out and make those moves where you're putting yourself in an unprecedented situation, making a phone call to someone we met maybe two years ago, briefly on a trade stand. But um, yeah, putting yourself in that situation, it just straight away, I was like, yeah, I, I like you. I really like you because not many people are willing to take risks um, and putting yourself in a, in a situation where I might go, you know what? how do you get my number? I don't want to talk to you sort of thing it is like, I give you full respect for that. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, I love helping people, love meeting new people and yeah, helping in any way I can always, always works kind of both ways as well. Yeah. I, and I'm such a believer in what you give out is what you get back. Um, I think obviously we spoke Friday evening last week and I was like, I literally phoned, I think I either phoned or saw Ash the following day. Um, and I was like straight away, I was like, man, we've got to do a podcast with him. I was like, I've looked into him. He is such an interesting guy. The way that you can hold a conversation, you're extremely articulate. I was like, we need to sit down and have a conversation with him because it would be so interesting to tell your story. 
Can't wait. So that's what we're here looking today. forward to. It. And if anyone is listening and wondering, Josh's phone number is 079. <laughs> <laughs> I get enough hate messages as it is. I do not need them to get my phone number. All, all the VPN messages that I've got on numbers so to send to you, bro. Um, so, like I say, obviously, got a background in strength and conditioning. How did that come about? Well, kind of going from the start, I was really into sports um, throughout school. I tried to get on all the sports teams and uh, I was kind of one of those kids that was never massively like athletically talented naturally. So I always had to put in like quite a lot of hard graft. Even playing rugby and football, I was the kid that was trying to do lots of running throughout the, the holidays and kind of go that way. But really, I got injured and it was going through the rehab stuff and um, spending a lot more time in the gym and working out, OK, this is the injury I've got. This is what I'm told I should be doing. How perfectly can I do the rehab? I want to get back playing as fast as possible. So I was also doing um, like GCSE PE. I went and did uh, A level um, sports. So that's where the the diploma came from through A level, and it just kind of went from there. I then went on to to university, did my undergraduate in sports science, and it was probably when I was doing my undergraduate that I thought people when they're being coached love the relatability if you're coaching somebody like even just as a personal trainer strength and conditioning coach and you're wanting stuff to be sport specific if you've never ever played that sport before it's it's a little bit of a barrier you can be the best coach in the world but sometimes it's always in the back of the athlete's mind like just how much do they understand what they're talking about and it's a little bit tricky because strength and conditioning, the skills that you learn through that are quite universal. You kind of, you get taught, okay, this is how you unpick what the physiological demands of the sport are. This is what particular moves and plays. So, you know, for football, oh, you have to be this strong in this condition to play a full 90 minutes of the game. So the skills are quite universal, but when it comes to equestrianism, I grew up around horses. I was so fortunate that my family are very horsey and that was a great way for me. So at university, undergraduate, I kind of knew that the two would go together. I didn't anticipate that it would happen kind of this soon, (laughs) but uh, I'm chuffed that I'm here and this is what I'm doing. Yeah. So looking at the industry then, um, obviously, you've put the two and two together. So what made you look at the equestrian industry and go, you know what, there is a massive gap for strength and conditioning coaching? I think it was even before I identified a gap in in the market and realized that not many people were doing. I think even if it was a massively saturated market like you have with professional level um, sports where they have these huge um, like multidisciplinary teams of, of support staff around them, um, physiotherapists, doctors, nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches. I think even if the market was saturated like it is with those sports, I'd, I'd still be doing it. Mm. Mm. Okay, so now we're sort of moving towards the riding aspect of things um, and where you've now introduced the strength and conditioning. Obviously, you're looking at the industry and you've got an, a perspective of the... Um, Sorry, Carl, turn your mic around a little bit. Is that better? It's the other side. Oh, the other side. Oh, oh there we go. Oh, my God, you sound so clear and sexy oh, there. I apologies. Lost, the I, just, I, just didn't want, I just didn't want to miss anything you were saying. Because <laughs> I offer so much value, obviously. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you do. You but do. Yeah, sorry. Um, so looking at the riders, obviously you're out there with the strength and conditioning coaching now. That's the service that you're offering. Obviously no different to me as a dressage rider i'll go to a show and i'm like oh my god i can't believe the standard of riding and the standard of people's knowledge so as a strength and conditioning coach that is working in the industry when you're looking at riders and you you turn up to a show what are you seeing that is of a hindrance to a rider or is making you go why aren't people taking strength and conditioning seriously in a in a sport and i think people don't actually realize they are an athlete. Mm, great, great question. I, I gave it to him myself to ask you specifically. <laughs> if you to know. I think in a very short answer, some of these riders are so unbelievably naturally talented. Could you imagine how much better they would be if they had the kind of 
support team that you would find in like Premier League football, what kind of a different level in league would that bring to the game? And I think going forwards, the more popular sort of the strength and conditioning and the fitness side of things becomes, the more we'll see up and coming riders that might not be the most like naturally talented riders in the world, but they will be able to compete at such a level. And it's interesting. I'm, I'm yet to work with some of the top, top level riders. It's something that I'm really ambitious to, to get into and pursue. But I'll, I'll be very interested if they sort of turn around and say, you know what, I'm as physically perfect as I can be. I can't physically get any fitter, any stronger, any more mobile than I am now. And I think when it comes to any kind of training, the attitude is almost everything. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 so I don't really come from a question background. So take what I say, the pinch of salt, and it'll either land or it won't. But um, what you're saying there is where they, I think there's probably an element where they, because they grew up with it, maybe they're so accustomed to, I've always been good, I've never had to really think too much about it or come from that aspect of, from an outsider. Maybe if you use someone that um, came from, say, uh, a, a very working class background in East Peckham and you was never going to have had the opportunity to grow up around horses like you were saying having that time and energy with attitude and putting into it it's hard work beats talent every time mm -hmm. and it's that sort of if you've got a young lad or girl from East Peckham who's not had that opportunity who's not just been coming to the family of horses but goes this is what I really want to do and I will make damn sure that I will do what I can and more to get into these top riders I would like to see the industry's reaction to that when actually well, I've always been around horses and now I'm being beaten I don't understand it that, that's what I'd like to see. I'd be so curious to see that potential shift and how what that might look like in the industry and you know you've raised a really really interesting point there and I think that's a big problem with the industry is that some people deem horse riding and any of the disciplines sometimes as like very elitist very expensive to get into and one of the things I would really love to achieve through my business is opening up as many opportunities to get anybody involved in horse riding. I think much like you have therapy dogs that help people with their mental health, my goodness, horses, they're so, so amazing 100%. in so many different ways. And I would just love to kind of get rid of that stereotype and just open it right the way up. And again, you would be so shocked at the amount of people that will come through and be so talented at it, yet they've never even thought of themselves as kind of getting into horse riding. Mm, yeah. And a huge issue that we're probably currently going through is the perception that it is all down to the horse, which to a certain extent, of course, if you've got the best horse in the world, it's going to help massively so. But if you look at a top rider like Charlotte Dujardin, she is one of the riders that does take her fitness seriously. Mm -hmm. I know she's spoken about she does running. I'm not sure specifically what else she does. But my rider crush is Catherine Defer. Mm. And she is in the gym all the time she is putting in work and she rides beautifully i don't think i personally do not think there's a better rider out there right now than her the way she sits on a horse she is so elegant and you can tell that she's in the gym working hard it's a really interesting one as well i think people that aren't too familiar with horse riding or the industry generally it, it makes me chuckle a little bit because <laughs> they kind of see oh you just sit on the horse. The horse does all the work for you. I think there's definitely a lot more of a 50-50 split and yourself as a dressage rider, mm. you know, if you've got somebody that was a, a total beginner at riding and they'd never ever sat on a dressage horse, they'd get on and the dressage horse would start half passing yeah. and doing pirouettes because it's being given all of these mixed signals. Cues. He just doesn't know the cues of what yeah. he's giving. Exactly. It, it becomes dangerous. Like I've, I've said many a time when you were learning to ride, there was only certain horses that I would put him on because... Should we revisit that viral TikTok video? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if I, yeah, true. But um, that was you jumping, let alone 
Yeah, but if you got on, say, Bailey, he would oh, have killed yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And not because he was being horrible, but because he'd be so confused by what you're doing in your balance and your it's coordination. It's frustration, isn't it? Like, I don't know what you're trying to tell me, and I'm going, why is this horse going backwards? I expect to go <laughs> forward, and he's just going, no, fuck off, get off me, I don't want you. And then I start crying, it's a real mess. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that is... Like you say, it's so easy to look and go. If you watch sort of the top dressage riders, you go, you do not, you don't look like you're doing anything. But that's the skill. They they've got so much skill and talent that they don't look like they're doing anything. And that's credit to any athlete. When you watch them do it, it looks so easy. Mm. When you try and do it yourself and you haven't done it too much, it's it looks horrible. It feels horrible. Yeah. But everybody's got to start somewhere. No and different to the swans. And that's the thing with the pros. They just make it look so effortless. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, that's the whole swan technique, isn't it? Like They look nice and grace on the top, but underneath they're, all, they're paddling like madmen to keep it going. Um, I'm going to throw a point in there that might take us off topic. Okay, back of go for it. Um, do you know what, I, I, and just since speaking, that recent sort of comparison in my head's come about, which I find not completely but some comparisons between the industries is um, equestrianism and Formula 1 because there's a lot of people that since Drive to Survive came out everyone went mad about Formula 1 and was like oh it's fantastic they sit in a car and there's just like these uh, young uh, good looking lads sort of get in a car make millions fantastic so they do like, almost like the old like uh, Senna and like uh, Chris Hemsworth thing it's just all that sort of ponds of it and they get in and it's nice and easy but there's a lot of fitness that goes in behind the scenes for Formula 1 um to maintain their ability to even drive, especially with like the G, the the G's that they're pulling around some of those corners, the their traps. I'd not want to get head butted by an eighteen year old Lando Norris because the, the traps on that man must be like fairly decent. I mean, they their simulations that they're having to pull to manipulate their body for their training is, is unbelievable. And it's I feel like it's that same compar the, the comparison I'm making is on the surface of it, it doesn't look like they they have to do that much physical exercise outside of the track as similar to equestrianism where it doesn't look like you have to do that much exercise outside of the sand school or whatever but actually you do but the difference is is formula one's got it equestrians hasn't but like you say really which is there's a huge similarity because in both circumstances they're having to control a shed load of power Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, I think, the huge, huge part of it is the amount of power you're having to control in a Formula One car or a horse, and the actual the effect that that is then having on your on your body. So, from your perspective, what should a rider be doing to uh, off the horse? Because, for example, if I go into the gym, right, I was in there earlier today. I've actually got a shoulder injury at the moment, so I spent a lot of time doing a lot of mobility work. I'm huge on it. I've got also a little bit of uh, experience. I was. Uh, I've done an power, unaffiliated powerlifting competition, but now my you mate... did really well on that. You managed to bench 40 kg. It was honestly, I'm really proud of him. Yeah, I know. Uh, thanks for coming and watching. <laughs> Fair play. Good shot, back. <laughs> nice to know you support me. I do. You know I do. <laughs> um, but whereas now, my main focus is on my range of movement, power, because... I've got to the point in my life where I'm like, okay, I'm 26 years old, but realistically, my peak performance is probably in the next sort of four or five years. From then, I'll probably get weaker genetically. So how am I going to be able to maintain that? Because I, I saw something, it was like, you'll get to an age where you sprint for your last time and you never know that you sprint. So when you stop sprinting, you are not, there's going to become a point where you can't do that anymore. So unless you're training in an optimal way, for life you will lose that ability to be able to do that and then bringing that back to the back to like the horses there's so many movements that you've got to do specifically in there for that control that you need what is a perfect plan for a rider to have it's a very loaded question isn't yeah it? i'm sorry i took that in so many different directions but it's just trying to get my point across here <laughs> yeah you've touched on some really really interesting stuff i I think one of the first things that I would say is there's no sort of one size fits all. There's no 
this is the bee's knees of a strength and conditioning program. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you know he's good, because he's hit the nail on the head right there. You can't generalise anything. And you might say, what is the number one exercise for dressage riders to do? And it would be like me asking you as a power lifter, dumbbells or kettlebells? It depends what you want to get out of it. It depends what your aim is. And I think when it comes to horse riders, there are so many factors that come to play, but actually it's quite simple at the same time. One of the things that a strength and conditioning coach kind of has to do is, is understand what the physical demands are of the sport. So when it comes to horse riding, even just general horse riding that isn't discipline specific in terms of dressage, show jumping, you can break it down even more and say when the horse progresses through the different gates, walk, trot, canter, gallop, the physiological demands, some of them stay the same, but some of them change. So the ones that kind of stay the same, I would term like an isometric abdominal brace. So isometric is just a, a, a static muscular contraction. Abdominals obviously re referring to your core. And then the brace is the, the constant tension that you have to have through your abdominals. So that's one of the ones that is almost always there. And it applies for all of the disciplines as well. The other one that you're going to sort of find, which is across the board, is your kind of lower body muscular endurance. So the, as it says on the tin, the muscles in your lower body having good sort of capacity and endurance for them. Tell me if I'm using, no. you know, too no, much no, jargon. No, or... no, no, no. This is absolutely perfect. Um, but very quickly, I'm, I'm going to nip in there because this will add to what you're about to say and what you're going into. But with general trainers, this angers me and it's because I've experienced it myself is they'll see a rider, their, their heels are up. So they shout heels down. Not do they ever give you a solution. Same thing, round shouldered. I, when I got into the gym, I did too much push work, tight chest, made my shoulders round. They would shout at me shoulders back. But not once did that, for how on, no one explained to me that I needed to, I've got such a tight chest, I need to work my posterior chain to then get stronger to be able to get my shoulders back. And this is my whole issue with this industry is they never look more than what they see. Do you reckon that's an ego thing? Laziness. I would say it and actually... And there's the shot. <laughs> He's not wrong, but I'll stand there. There will be a shot. <laughs> I, I would say it really boils down to the quality of coach that you have. Mm. Every good coach that I've come across, if they give you some feedback and they tell you to correct somebody, something, there's a very, very clear reason as to why they're telling you. So if they say, right, Josh, you need to put your heels down more when you're going through this particular phase of the test. Mm. This is why it's going to help you keep that lower leg position or it's going to make things easier for you in terms of maintaining your posture. Boom, mm. done. That's that's the reason why I'm telling you. So same for me, whenever I write something in a training program, whether it's the particular exercise, the focus of the exercise, reps, sets, tempo mm. of the whatever you say, there's a very, very clear reason as to why. Completely. But where I would say I'll take that is, for example, for like, I've been very lucky. I've trained for international trainers. I've been, I, I've been so lucky. I was very well supported by my parents. So I had access to fantastic trainers from a young age, but they would, like I say, they would say heels down and that's fine. But if you've got tight calves and terrible ankle mobility, that's pretty much impossible. And that's where... I struggle because, like you say, I could look at someone and go, right, okay, you like when we I saw that when we spoke in the meeting the other day, I was like, I looked at what you were talking about regarding hip mobility, and you were also saying not not, not like you were showing that you need to get your hip stronger as well. It's not just about stretching them. So that's a solution. People don't realize why do you struggle with sitting trot? You've got tight hips, so you can't. Your back then is tight, so you can't absorb the 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 power that's coming through your body but by getting your hips stronger and stretching between the both of them and putting a plan in specifically for you your back will be soft enough for you to allow to sit into the saddle but this is where for example i remember when i was doing sitting trot and i was getting it 
I'd become rigid and I couldn't help it. But no one would tell me how to fix it. Whereas it's taken me going off into a completely different industry and really getting into my gym and having a love for that, that I've been able to go, this now makes sense. I couldn't do that because my hips were so tight. And that is what angers me is that this, it's almost like a so amateur-esque in such a professional industry full of money where it should actually go, you know what? We need to look at this as a bigger picture and go, firstly, it needs to be more commercial. And by, by more commercial, that will then be able to attract, like you say, team of people behind the riders to be able to be, be better physically, nutritionally and in every aspect of their performance. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one. I, suppose something sort of quite controversial for me is riders love yoga they love pilates and what i would say is on the whole that's usually better than doing nothing but the time that you give to doing yoga and pilates you could do something that is so much more strategic you could, you could spend half the time doing very individualized, specific mobility to you. And, you know, forget everything else, only mobility. And it'll just have so many more benefits for you than attending like a group Pilates session. Yeah. It's, it's not specific to your discipline. It's not specific to you. Like you say, you really tighten your calves. You might go and do a yoga session. One or two of the poses might help your calves a little bit. Mm-hmm. But compared to doing a mobility session where the biggest emphasis is on getting your ankles moving. And again, this is where it really helps if you work with somebody that knows what they're doing. Mm. I want to say something that um, from my non-question background might sound controversial. Um, On the yoga side of it, even I, from my perspective... Uh, with that carries very little weight in terms of knowledge that I offer. I see a lot of various training or coach. I'm trying to think about how to say this correctly. So it's not like just a really uneducated sentence that sounds just, f- just pure fire. Uh, of similar to that um, is they're they're doing training sessions similar to yoga, but I look at it and I go there is no fucking relevance to what you are doing. And I don't want to even dare think what you're probably charging, especially this industry, because it's people are like the, um, how there's no, I'm going to say it because that's what I'm going to say. Like, that sound wrong, but people love to upsell in this industry and take people's money in this industry. So dare think what they're charging for something they've probably read offline of like a pure gym PT course, which is just probably just straight out of the book. Um, and even from my level of riding ability, who for someone who's been training every day or most days for the last five years, I get on a horse and I'm like, wow, it is hard work. It is, and I, I give full credit to my, my partner when she comes back, she's like, I'm shattered. I'm like, right, so you, you sort of feel how I feel getting off the wall. I'm like, how many horses are you in today? Oh, 10. I'm like, what? how have you done that? Um, and that's such a, such an interesting point. I mean, Josh, you were asking me a little bit earlier, if I remember correctly, you know, what do I sort of see? And it does deeply upset me. I've, I've been to quite a few like eventing fixtures over the past weeks and months. And I've seen the riders warm up their horses. Have they warmed themselves up? How much uh, focus and emphasis are they putting towards their hydration Mm. both of which will hugely affect their performance and you know these guys and girls are riding four five horses at each of these eventing fixtures you're just putting yourself at such a disadvantage yeah John. and in that aspect mentally as well like if you're saying you're not fueling yourself correctly because theoretically they need to refresh their electrolytes specifically in between each horse. That's what my emphasis would have been is we like get my electrolytes back to normality. If they're not doing that, they're not going to be thinking correctly. And they don't also, like you say, from a physical point of view, strength and conditioning, amazing, but also mentally they're fitter and stronger. They'll think clearly under pressure. And I think, again, that is something that is hugely missed out of, but, um, 
going back into you a little bit more obviously sorry can I just interject just to add one little bit of value that yeah. for people listening great great point in terms of like the education for people listening we, you touched on like um, like hydration and yeah. you touched on like the, the vitamins you take yeah. just quickly what for, for a rider listening that wants to improve that how much sort of how hydrated should they be is there any supplements that you think or recommend that they should take that's gonna like you say with your I know some of the stuff we've spoken about previously it makes your brain wired <laughs> is there anything that you go room if you're listening to this I recommend you need to start buying this amount of water to drink or getting these supplements supplements are great but they usually offer about a 2% um, increase to your performance the hydration you're looking at more between like 40 to 60% so I would say electrolytes really really good one because you're replenishing what you're losing through your sweat but hydration all all the way just consistently try and drink water throughout the day scientifically a lot of uh, like research papers say you can achieve what they term like a, a you hydrated state which is consuming um 500 milliliters of water sort of two hours before you compete so it's quite a good benchmark but the caveat everybody is different my advice just try and keep yourself hydrated steadily throughout the day you know don't go downing mm. loads and loads yeah. of uh, <laughs> liters of water before you, you just need to go to the loop <laughs> I, I i really feel that because i think i drink about four liters a day and i just don't stop pissing <laughs> i'm too hydrated <laughs> but also touching on that i think it's really important the quality of water you're drinking i'm massively into that because there was actually a study that showed that 98% of the population is uh, dehydrated. And that isn't necessarily because they're not drinking enough water, but that's actually because the water doesn't actually contain the minerals and nutrients that we drink out of the tap. Mm. So that is why I'm a massive, I drink coconut water because it actually has the right levels that it should do with the magnesium, the sodium in it for you to drink. And that is what, again, like I guess where I was touching the electrolyte side of things, it's replenishing that so you're able to be actually hydrated with the water you're consuming. It's a really interesting thing and it's something that I haven't looked into too much, mm. but I think you can find advantages everywhere. everywhere yeah. um, but this is obviously, like you say, this is where you've gone into the industry and you've looked and gone. It's quite amateur. Well, no, I say I said that, not you. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but it's quite amateur. I'll say it too. I'll back you, bro. Thank it's you. very amateur. But you've also experienced working in professional environments. You've been with New, Newcastle Rugby Club, Luff, Loughborough as well. Um, and you've also worked with England Athletics too. So what have you learned from working in those industries that has sort of made you the person that you are now with the knowledge that you can then sort of bring to the industry? One of the most interesting things that I've kind of come across is, uh, especially with... Um, nearly. I nearly. Nearly. Oh, nearly. I, nearly I, it. Oh, <laughs> I saved it. I saved it. <laughs> especially with my role with, uh, with England Athletics, I was working with um, the Youth Development Programme and you just got to get the basics right. I think, I think Josh, you're a really good example of this because you've done a lot of your own training and um, sort of behind the scenes and, you know, whether it's been entirely equestrian focused or not, I, you know, you've done lots of uh, powerlifting as well, but you've got to get the basics right. And it's great to see something on the internet or, you know, another equestrian rider has said, oh, you have to do this exercise, you have to put it in your program. Okay, what am I trying to achieve from this? Because if you can't do a body weight squat with good technique, why you then start doing some explosive thing, jump with kettlebells when you can't even squat properly? So I think get the basics right. And having come from uh, like other professional sports as well, there are so many uh, different things that you can look into. Um, everything from from supplements to how you taper your training um one of the other really interesting ones that i've come across is if you go and compete overseas one of the things that especially the olympic level guys will do is they will look at the environmental factors so the temperature the humidity and the 
time zone difference. So whether you're competing, you know, five hours ahead, five hours behind compared to sort of where you live. So the amount of detail that you can go into is unreal. Um, But that's why I say get the basics right. Because if you start going in and saying, oh, you know, there are all of these fantastic supplements, multivitamins and uh, creatine monohydrate. You become reliant on something else, I guess. Well, it's not even that. You're just, you're not getting the best bang for your buck all the time that you're Mm. investing into doing the, and the money that you'll spend on it as well. You know, if you start supplementing something like beta alanine or creatine monohydrate, it's going to give you a 2% advantage. But if you're not consistent with your training and you go to the gym once every two weeks and you're slogging yourself riding five horses a day, you, there's so much that you're missing. F- forget the supplements. Try and just eat foods that you know are, everybody has got a, a pretty good idea about what's nutritionally beneficial and what isn't. So just focus on getting the basics right. Try and eat consistently, eat the right foods, try and do some form of training. I think if you're completely sedentary and you only do horse riding, try and do a little bit of a walk and some mobility and you will shock yourself at the benefits that you get from it, hugely. Where do you start when you're working with a new rider? How does how does that look? So whenever I take on somebody new, Uh, And this was something that I've kind of learned over the past couple of years is that um, a screening is is a really useful thing. And what I kind of mean by that, again, it comes back to how well the rider, the athlete moves. So the screening will look at their squat and their technique. Uh, It'll, again, I focus my screening, it's very rider specific. So I'll look in depth at their hips what are their range of movement like how mobile are they and you know you almost forget the the strength aspect of it so there's no hardcore testing that goes on it's a very low-key screening only takes a couple of minutes but the amount of information that that gives me because i might take on a rider and they say i have a really really sore back I do loads of horse riding, loads of mucking out, and it gives me a really sore back. Okay, that's the information that they're giving me, but it's subjective to them. From my perspective, yeah, I'll take that into account, but I also need to have a look at all the other bits of the puzzle. So the the screening is entirely objective. uh, I use a measure from, especially with the squat, from zero to three, three being the best, zero being the worst. And... I like to think from my client's perspective, it's a very black and white measure. And especially with the squat, it's something that I'll retest. It takes 30 seconds because they do two repetitions of an overhead squat. And I can say six weeks ago, we, we started training. You scored a one. Now you're at a two. Instantly progress. And I can visually see it because I'll film it for them as well. Yeah, and I imagine it's once they... It's no difference like when we're in the gym and we're like... Um, y- you can see, I, I, I trained for so many years where I wasn't tracking my... I don't do it as much anymore, but I, I, was, I wasn't tracking how many reps I was doing to what weight I was doing. And every so often, if I'm flustered, I'll go into the gym. I can't remember what I was lifting last week or how many sets was I? And I, when I started tracking it, I remember I had a conversation with you not too long after doing it. I was like... But I can actually now see my change in training. And this is someone that I've been training for two, three years. And automatically, because I managed to see visually that change by numbers, these are things I've written over the period of like two, three, four weeks. My attitude to training felt so much better. And I felt so much better in myself for doing so. And I'm all for simplicity. There's almost no need to make things more complicated than they have to be. So I think if you're an everyday rider and a big part of it for me is longevity. People, when they love riding horses, they never want to stop. So when people become a little bit more sort of health and well-being conscious, I might say to them, take a a short video of you doing, you know, just a, a... a walk, a trot, a canter, then implement a little bit of mobility into it. 
have a think about how painful, uncomfortable your back was before you started training. Take the video before you start the training. Commit to it religiously for four to six weeks. And what I say by that is don't go and hammer yourself for three hours in the gym because it just won't last. You need to integrate it no nice one, and gently. No one needs to be in the gym for three hours. But yeah, ex exactly. A hundred percent. And, you know, you might just do a little bit of mobility on the yard before you get on. But take a little video. Think about how yeah. you feel. Do it for four to six weeks. And you, again, you'll be amazed with how such a little change has a huge difference. Yeah, it's really interesting you say about longevity. And this is one of those sports, actually, for the, the actual amount of fitness, fitness that's required there's no age limit on it. Whereas like you see in football, there's a cap, probably around 32, you're done. A lot of them play a lot further than that. 27, 28, you're around a peak. Um, whereas you look at the likes of John Whitaker, man is like, what, 80? <laughs> No, you just throw shots at John Whitaker. Wow, <laughs> but no, but it's a compliment. He's doing yeah. really well for like his age. I don't, know, I don't actually know how old he is. You're just saying like you can have a real long you athletic can have, career. Yeah, you, you can have a real long athletic career in this industry, and it's probably why it's so important as well that people really take on board one the modernisation of this industry, and two what what we're talking about here with rider fitness is you can have that long life in this industry, and you can enjoy it. But why would you not want to enjoy it as best you can? Because it may be all well and good when you're 22, 23 and you sort of fall off and it hurts, but you get back on, you can move around. If you're jumping, and I mean, back to John, sorry, John, I'm not trying to throw in any shots here. If you're jumping, I assume, like 130s, 140s at, at that age, you're going to want to put your body in the best order possible that you're not going to just come away and go, oh, I feel quite oh, that's a bit stiff. Oh, I don't know. I get, it's when you get out of bed, you're like, oh, no. And it's really interesting that you say that, and that's almost one of the biggest selling points that I use when people aren't massively convinced and they kind of, oh, I can ride the horses and, and get by. Okay, but how, how long do you want to do it for and could you imagine how much better you'd feel afterwards? And the, the selling points that I use is it's going to help your longevity. Even by doing a little bit of training, you're going to minimize your injury risks, not completely eliminate them, because if you get thrown off the horse, there's a likelihood you're going to get injured. That, that, that's, that's exactly where I was going to take it, actually, was uh, injury prevention. And I say this because obviously I've got a background in the gym, but it was actually you were there that time. You didn't witness it, but I had oh, a... Come. I had a horse um, come over on top of me. It broke the saddle. That's how much force oh, yeah. that came over on top of me. And I swear to God, if I didn't take care of myself and was in the gym and physically fit and strong, I that would have ended up. You know, I would have ended up potentially dead. Um, or at best in a wheelchair, me pushing him. Uh, <laughs> well, nice of you to pick up the positives. Um, Kevin and Perry. But it was also like, for example, I remember Kevin Hart touched on it. He had a car accident. And the, their doctors and nurses said to him, if you had, if it was something to do with his rib cage, if he didn't have that protection there, he would have been dead as well. So even like I say, injury prevention, you can think of that in two ways, i.e., the longevity, like the the pressure that your back's taking and withstanding and preventing like uh, repetitive injury, repetitive strain, sorry, or a freak accident like I had. The benefits of strength and conditioning are huge. Absolutely. And there are huge, huge benefits to it. Uh, and that's why it's such a good sort of selling point for me is because I say, look, even with just a little bit of training, you will minimize your injuries. What I mean by that is as a strength and conditioning coach, we're going to do some strengthening and we'll do some conditioning. Horse riders, much like um, I would imagine Formula One riders are very conscious of their, their body size, their shape, their weight, rightfully so. And every time some of their faces... It's just plastered all over their faces. You say, we'll do some strength training. And they go, oh my goodness. Don't want to do that. I, and somehow I think that they think I'm going to turn them into the Hulk. 
Yeah. And they'll do a week's worth of strength training and they'll have enormous biceps and yeah. like huge wish. shoulders. I wish. It's very, I wish. I know, but it's very similar. Like women say that they, they, I don't want to lift heavy weights because I don't want to look really muscular. And it's like, that won't happen because you're not training a certain way. And everybody that has done some strength training understands how hard it is to actually build muscle. Mm-hmm. And so much of the, well, the weight gain is dictated by your food intake. And you can, no one likes to really admit that. You, you can get stronger and your actual shape, size, weight can be identical. Mm. But the reason why I always incorporate strength training into every program and with every client that I work with is because the strength training doesn't just strengthen your muscles. Like what you said about being thrown off a horse, the strength training, it strengthens your bones, your tendons, your ligaments, all of the soft tissues that you have. So even when you get thrown off a horse, if your bone mineral density is higher than it was having not done any training, you're going to be that bit more robust to it. And This isn't even taking into account all of the performance and physical benefits that you're getting from it. And I think that's another really interesting thing. As a horse rider, why would I need to be strong? Okay, well, how do you stop the horse? You you have to put more pressure on the reins. You have to um, pack your shoulder blades together. You have to push your legs away. All of these things require strength. If you're working with a very strong horse or a young horse that you're working with, you need to have some strength. And and that's where it ties into the performance. Uh, grip strength is also a really, really important one. And when I say that, I don't mean gripping the reins as hard as you physically can. But when you have that strength, you can keep that constant contact on and maintain the same pressure. But that's where you need the endurance for it as well because it's great to be strong but you have to have the endurance where you can maintain it throughout the entire dressage test the entire uh show jumping test yeah like you say you've just hit the nail on the head with so many different things because i think that is the perception of a lot of people is when you talk about strength training is that the riders then become strong riders. But what that actually allows you to do is do less because you've got that strength. You're not having to try as hard. So it actually makes it easier for a rider to be in a position where you know that you're not having to work as hard. You're you're able to do less because you're, you're physically stronger and your cardiovascular endurance is better. So you're at peak performance. And obviously I think as a rider myself, I've ridden horses that are far more difficult than others and when it's difficult everything becomes harder so it becomes harder to sit to the horse obviously from a dressage perspective it becomes difficult to that i my my legs aren't moving as much i'm not working so hard i know there's for example i've been lazy horses and you go into a ring they get behind your leg and i'm like bloody i need to try and get you in front of my leg and then what happens is people overwork And then the horse gets lazier and gets more behind the leg. Whereas if you're in a position to be able to stay strong in yourself and be able to give that horse one big kick, leave it alone and sit there and have that strength in your, in the mind as well. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand is from the training that you're doing off the horse, you're training your mind as well to know that you're trusting the process of what you're doing. And from me putting myself into another sport after doing the being a dressage rider, a professional, taking that really seriously, I improved mentally more off the horse than I ever did on the horse. And I think a lot of that is down to working with an animal that has its own mind. Thanks, Carl. No worries. <laughs> I've called you worse. Don't worry. Um, but also a different approach, keeping it fun to be able to realize like, okay, this doing off this off the horse is benefiting me on the horse now here. And I obviously for a period of time, I I fell out of love with riding, Um, fell in love with the gym. And that's where I went down the powerlifting route. Whereas now I'm probably the way that I'm training, the way that I look after the mobility aside of what I'm doing. I'm now off the horse doing what I probably have always needed to do 
for me to perform at better while riding because my main focus is range of motion range of movement sorry okay right i've got shoulder issues i know that right okay so i do so much mobility releasing my shoulders i spend so much time this this week for me has been a write-off in the gym because realistically i've lost all the strength because i couldn't even look over my neck on tuesday whereas i was in the gym every single morning still doing the same then i'm going back and then i'm doing my sprint training so i don't lose that power because that's what you look at. You look at us, look at a sprinter and you look at a, a guy that runs the marathon. Look who's got the muscle. <laughs> the yeah. sprinter, you yeah. know? Um, and, and that is where, like, of course, with riding, it is, yeah, of course, there's some endurance for it. But it, so much of it is that strength over a period of time. And that's what I'm looking. You've got to look at different sports, look at, open your eyes and go, okay, we can take this and this from this industry. For me, it's been massively the gym, the mobility. Okay. I was very lucky I came across someone that was really into their mobility because of football. So I've taken so much off that into what I do. I've also then looked, found someone who's in America I've never met. He's huge into his athletics. Some of the stuff that he's doing mobility-wise with resistant bands was mind-blowing for me. How to open up my shoulders more using the resistant bands. Very simple things that people can do on the yard. You tie a resistant band around an arena fence, you could be releasing your shoulders, opening your chest more. But no one does it. And like what you've just said, takes about five minutes, yeah. if not less. Yeah. You take one resistance band with you, huge, huge benefit. I think I'm, like, if you're at an international competition and you're doing that, okay, I've, I've competed right now. I need to look after, replenish my nutrition, which would be the first thing that you do if you're a rugby player. I know when they were doing the Lions tour and they went over to, I think they were out in Hong Kong. It was like 40 degrees and it was very, very humid. The first thing that they do is replenish uh, nutrition. So it was the, the water intake, hydration, and then the food intake. Because some of those rugby players in that period of time had lost over a stone from an hour and a half training session. An hour it's and a half. Mental. But that's because it's monitored and looked after. What have you, when you're riding at huge competitions in heat, a lot of the time in European countries, you've got to compete with a show jacket on and a hat on. You're in leather boots, you're in thick clothing, and you might be in 33, 34 degrees heat. Think about everything you're losing. Your performance over that period of time is, is going to slowly get worse and worse yeah. and worse. But do you know what you're doing? As soon as you get off that horse, you're looking after that horse to the best of their ability. You'll be given everything to maximise yeah. that horse's potential for the rest of the week. So, but you are not doing that horse any justice yeah. because you haven't looked after yourself. No. And this is why I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. It's, it is really frustrating to, to talk about and, and watch out. At the level of, if you're just like a, a, a happy competitor, I'm, I'm happy putting, hacker. No, for. but like, no, I'm actually gonna, I've, I've changed it. A happy competitor. You know, people that just like to compete. They're yeah. not trying to do it for like the big prize money. They just enjoy it. Fair play. Look, this is going to benefit you regardless. This will benefit everyone regardless. What really sort of makes me go, but why <laughs> would you not do it is when these people are when when i first got into horses and josh was like i was like oh they're they're jumping around some fences and he was like yeah they're jumping around some fences for half a million fucking pounds i'm like you what i said i might start learning to ride a horse if that's the prize money i would have started this years ago so what i don't understand is if you're trying to compete at the level which is going to be what i can buy a nice really nice car with that why would you not do it? That's what I don't understand because I'm just going to say it straight. The top competitors aren't doing this. They're not doing it. We've spoke to them. We know some of them and it's nothing against them, but we are giving you the in currently on something that is not being done. The people that are winning these big prize monies at the big shows and all the titles and all the fancy ribbons and trophies aren't doing the basic thing that you should do in any sport and that from an outside from a very limited knowledge side it's like come on what the, the industry yeah it is it, it is it is a, a really interesting thing and something that I don't fully understand even if you think in a very crude way that there's a 50-50 split in terms of performance between the horse and the rider the horse, in my mind, is the one that gets spoiled and the rider is the one that gets neglected. 
the horse gets the most breathable, lightweight uh, yeah. brushing boots, <laughs> numb nose, <laughs> and uh, it gets, you know, 10 different supplements. You and, take a mortgage out for your horse each, mu- you, each you, month. You know, you could, you could go to a stable yard, whether they're professional or unprofessional, and, and say, okay, how many like hard feeds would you give your horse in a day? How much hay, haylage, you know, what are you doing to look after them food wise? And there was every single day without fail, the horse is getting this, it's getting this, it's getting this. Mm. Ask them what they eat. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a half a, a chicken salad in the morning yeah. and usually I won't eat for another 10 hours. But you always hours. see they go to these stay away shows, it's che- cheesy chips, yeah. cheesy chips. The cheese isn't even melted. It's not even good and you've paid £8.50, <laughs> cheesy chips. But it, from what you're saying, like I know as well, but what you're saying, they have that skill of routine because they, it's like brought into the way they look after the horses. It's routine. Like the horse gets this, receives this every single day. That's a skill they have. Imagine then taking that skill and putting it into your performance. Like, like you would dramatically, dramatically improve. And I think I have to touch on it slightly, but Gemma Stevens, she was competing in the Al-Shara uh, Hicks did Derby this weekend. Uh, we were down there. I don't, I don't think I saw her, but whatever. Um, but I think she, yeah, I'm not too sure how she did, but actually her PT was there, posted a video of Gemma training off the horse. And I was like, you know what? Fair play. You are taking this seriously and you're acting like a professional rider. Do not call yourself a professional if you're not acting like a professional. You may look after your horse professionally, which makes your horse a professional. If you're not looking after your, yourself professionally, don't claim to be a professional and that really angers me and it'll probably upset a load of people but do they look after their horse professionally or do their grooms look after their horse professionally they, it doesn't matter they put it in place that the horse is looked after professionally and everything is done but if you're a professional rider you're competing internationally for Great Britain or whatever country you compete for if you aren't willing to dig deep into looking after yourself your nutrition your health your fitness for me I lose a massive lack of respect and I can't look at to you as a professional it's I would almost be inclined to ask them, do you, do you think that it would be beneficial? Okay, if, if you're telling me that, yeah, looking after yourself more would benefit you, why aren't you doing it? Yeah. And it's that is why I don't, I'm, I, it angers me because I'm like, that is it. You're not professional. I can't, I look at some of the, you look at how some of these athletes, like for example, Andy Murray, see what he puts himself through physically to perform at the best he that he could or what have you or so, these top athletes you look at the documentary yeah. with Conor McGregor yeah. and the suffering he puts himself through to perform at his best yet you as a rider aren't willing to just gym two or three times a week the thing is you, you see the sport you see the athlete you see them get on the football pitch and you all you're doing is sitting at home and you're enjoying it you're cheering them on for 90 minutes Wimbledon's on over the course of a couple of days you pop in and out from the living room you see him playing tennis and you go oh it looks really good and it's the same for someone no different for Formula 1 they sit down for 52 laps and you go oh, that's, that, that was a really good watch you only see the end product and that I think is not the problem but I think that's where an element of there hasn't been the exposure in this industry not just this specific thing the whole industry is outdated by decades that it's not actually looked at it and gone yes they look fantastic jumping that yes they look fantastic doing their dressage test but what is it that's gone behind making that look so easy what is it that they like say Andy Murray has done 5k runs four times a week to get to his cardio that he can go 12 uh, games with Nadal or, or why they can uh, Lando Norris can go around a, a lap uh, fit a, a track 52 times in uh, Abu Dhabi under that heat and that condition what's gotten to that level well maybe part of it is the riders not seeing themselves as athletes mm. they don't put themselves in that bracket and that's why they don't do it which is something that I would definitely like to change and again if you know that some kind of training is going to benefit you or you could make your training a lot more strategic then why wouldn't you who um 
who who would you who are you looking at at the moment? Who's in like a, 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 in the top ten? I, I'm probably afraid to phrase this terribly. That you look at and you go, I feel like I could really improve you to a different level. Bear in mind, we can clip this and tag them in it, and then there is <laughs> exposure. No, I, you know what? I don't think that there's the thing from my perspective is I kind of have to understand everything without seeing what their sort of like day-to-day routine is what if any training they are doing you know what their nutrition is looking like it's really difficult for me to kind of single out one particular person or say you should be doing this and and that for me is where I come back to nail the basics Mm. and the basics for me is moving well and just nutrition and food and fluid intake in in a in a nutshell i think a key component that you sort of keep touching on is that you really work around them and what they currently do you're not really asking them to make drastic changes you're saying okay this is your lifestyle this is what you're doing we assess the whole picture and then we cater around it if you can only do two sessions a week that's fine but there'll be another rider that'll be okay well we look at you we believe you can do this. And I think that's the tailored approach that you are, that you're talking about. But also um, on your website, you have training programs, four week training programs um, specific to different disciplines. So my question there is, we'll go into the training program slightly a little bit more, but what is the difference between each? What are you looking at? It, what makes a polo uh, training program a polo and what makes a dressage? training program mm. dressage so you've touched on a number of of really great things um i think first of all whenever i work with anybody i think it's a step in the wrong direction to say okay you usually get up at 9 a.m and this is what your day looks like okay we're gonna start training at five o'clock in the morning and we'll do two hours and you've gone from doing absolutely nothing it I think when people try and get into fitness on their own, they go from one extreme to the other, having done nothing to doing loads. And it just is so out of character with their routine. It never lasts or you hate every second of it because you're forcing yourself to do it so much. And that's very much sort of the mentality that I take. And again, the training has to be enjoyable to an extent. Some people focus on, okay, this is what I'm getting out of the training and that's why I enjoy it. But if you can enjoy the training whilst you're doing it, even better. So whenever I work with people, it has to be quite a lighthearted, fun environment, uh, lots of jokes being made. But when we're working hard, we're working hard. And the intensity is definitely there. In terms of the training programs themselves, yeah, I've tried to make something that is quite affordable that as well, it's not going to put you a ton of money out of pocket. It's very, very good value for money, in my opinion. Um, you know, maybe even with a personal trainer that you might find locally to where you live, you might pay 40 to 50 pounds per session. And my training programs are four weeks and they're about the same price as that, if I remember correctly. Uh, and so whereabouts can they find these training programs if they're interested? So if they were interested, yep. all of these training programs are available on my website. I've specifically designed them um, to be discipline specific. So I've also done sort of two for each discipline. So I've said, okay, here's a training program for each of the disciplines. You can either have one where you can complete it in the gym and it, a lot of the exercises involve gym equipment, not crazy, crazy mm. specific gym equipment, but general gym equipment, or it can be something you can do at home. So giving people options is quite good. And the way that each of them vary. So you, you spoke about the, the polo training program. So again, you think about the, the physiological demands that you have to be able to put up with just to play. So one of the things that makes polo 
different is, well, firstly, you, you're swinging a mallet whilst you're riding the horse, but there's a lot of twisting with your upper body. So those demands, again, are replicated. Similarly, with the dressage rider versus a show jumping program, the dressage rider, it's very focused on movement control, movement quality, and the a lot of kind of isometric movements. So for someone that's listening that maybe is unsure on what that is, so what specific movement would you be recommended for a dressage rider in that situation? Uh, that's included in the training program or, or just, no, generally? Just, just generally just that so we said when we're talking about isometric what are you sort of <clears throat> referring to what exercises yeah so i i said earlier that the two sort of fundamentals demands that are always there whether you're a happy hacker or you're you're a pro show jumper first one is the constant tension that you have to have in your core people are pretty conscious about that and then the second one is your lower body endurance so those are in all of the training programs so if you're a dressage rider apps those are the basics that is your bread and butter so kind of get used to to those sorts of movements when it comes to core training this is one of the things that really upsets me is when i see either people doing it themselves or when they work with a personal trainer and they do something like sit-ups it's you, when are you sitting on the horse and crunching forwards and backwards yeah. so this is where the sport specificity comes into it and where a, a strength and conditioning coach might differ from a personal trainer so when it comes to me doing core and abdominal work, I try to replicate the same m muscle work that you would be doing on the horse. There is a bit of a fine line because people try and take that to an extreme where you might find them almost sitting on a saddle and completing exercises or going to the gym and trying to replicate that seated position that they would find themselves when riding. So within strength and conditioning or just performance, there's um, a sort of a, a concept which is called dynamic correspondence. What it basically is, is speaking to is when you try and replicate something too much, it can have a big downside. So a really nice example that I like to use is if you imagine that you're a cricket player and you're, you're a bowler. If you say, I want to have a, a faster or more powerful bowl, I, instead of throwing a cricket ball, I'm going to throw a, um, a shot put ball. So instead of something that weighs 100 grams, it's two or three kilos. So while logically that kind of makes sense, what happens is instead of you using the, the technique behind bowling, you muscle it. You, you just try and launch it as hard as you can. Yeah. And, the, and, the and, the reason, and the reason why that is a downside is because then when you get rid of the heavy object and you go back to the cricket ball, naturally you just muscle the throw. Yeah, it's and the your window. accuracy is all over the place yeah so you could look at it the same way with people that want oh, i'm a boxer i want to hit harder big heavy dumbbells in my hands that's going to make me a lot stronger yeah your speed's going to go out the window your accuracy is going to go out the window and almost what i'm getting at here is what are you trying to get out of the exercise okay if we're focusing on working your abs hard do you have to be in a seated position? If you're telling me that by you replicating sitting on a horse versus doing a different exercise is infinitely better and you can rationalize to me why, then that's fine. But you always have to, okay, this is the reason why we're doing this exercise. This is why we're doing this exercise in this very particular way. And scaling it at the right time, like you say, you can't you can't just go straight for let's go really heavy and then just think muscle's gonna come. You need to grow it a little bit so you mm. have that that development of muscle or power or speed and then adding that at the same time while keeping the technique. And that's where I think the time comes into it. People don't want to commit the time to doing it because it's out their day and they don't they just don't want to start it. Yeah. 
what do you really want at the end of the day? Do you mm. want do you want to stay as you are, or do you want to try and improve? Yeah, I think we've got one body. Why do we Why do we <laughs> see what we, what we can do? Yeah, exactly. And it kind of like t- bringing it back when you referred to sit ups. I remember when I was uh, sixteen, and I went through a stage where in my head I perceived the dress I'd rider to be stick thin. So I literally mm. would all I would do is run in sit ups. But actually, by doing the sit-ups, all I was doing was rounding my shoulders more and more and more. <laughs> so my position got worse, and I had because I thought oh, I need to look skinny. I need to do this. So also, it comes from a lack of knowledge, and especially with riders, mm. riders are very, very prone to back soreness, back pain, back injuries. So uh, you know, you mm. want to work your abs, but I would argue sit-ups are probably going to aggravate yeah, that exactly, and. I think the lack of knowledge that I was touching on with the caliber of rider fitness already in the industry, it's wrong. (laughs) Predominantly most of what they're doing and what is out there for the general sort of rider to look at, it's so wrong. Like we touched on the yoga situation earlier. A lot of riders do yoga and Pilates and like you say, it's not, it's probably better than doing nothing, but there is like such a low level of knowledge about rider fitness in the industry and what is accepted as rider fitness and mainstream i can imagine from your perspective you look at that and you must be like oh my god i want to bang my head against the wall because it's awful Uh, yeah there is a ton of misinformation out there and it it's troublesome because people will look at it and then go and do it yeah. And do you know the worst thing is they would look at what you're doing and they'd be more shocked at what you're saying than what is already out in there in the industry. Yeah, yeah. I think part of that though boils down to popularity and how yeah, you sort of, of marketed yourself. But I suppose you kind of get what you pay for. Mm. You know, if you yeah. do your research about somebody, that's yeah, well you say what that, you get. You pay a load of money for a lot of shit out there. In fairness, it's uh, what well, the three things I've learned from this podcast, Henry, is hydrate, mobility, don't fucking do yoga. <laughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't say don't do yoga. Yoga is definitely better than absolutely nothing. You, you can just. You can get you can do so, so much, much better with your time, more. so much better with and your time. You, you know, if you love your yoga, keep doing your yoga, but maybe look into incorporating something else into your training regimen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where people can find you, um, give yourself a plug. Where where can people find your social media handles? Uh, so all of my uh, social media, my website, everything is just the name of the business, Optimal Equestrian Performance. Um, I've got Instagram, Facebook. I've got a, a, a YouTube channel, which is uh, yet nice. to have uh, videos nice. posted on it. Maybe this will be the, the first one. Are there. Um, and yeah, all of, all of the information kind of about me, my background, what I kind of like focusing on is is through my website. So I would, again, really encourage people to, to get in touch with me. Always happy to, to chat with people, always looking to, to work with new and exciting people. And I think, you know, attitude is everything. If there's somebody that's really, really hungry to do some training and or they're sick of having a, a, a <laughs> sore back. <laughs> Get in touch. Give, they want to kick yoga to the touch. <laughs> <laughs> really cool to yoga. Uh, like this is from a personal point of view. Uh, whether or not people take my opinion seriously anymore, I don't know. But no, they do. Um, You've, you're rebranded. You're, 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 more, rebranded. you're more respectable now. I'm, more, I'm slightly more respectable. Uh, but I've been in the industry a long time. I've been very lucky to work with top international riders. Been in the British setup. Experienced it all. So I've never come across someone with the knowledge that you do uh, from the strength and conditioning. Obviously, looking at what you, why I always refer back to hip mobility because it's always been my my weakest thing, and how I for periods of time tried to stretch them when I should have been strengthening them. That straight away was like he knows what he's talking about. So for people that are wanting to better the riding I've not come across a man better than Henry so 
Like yeah. I say, I too kind, too more. kind. He doesn't even say things like that about me. But yes. um, you know, I, I keep saying about you know getting the basics right and really working on the fundamentals. And a big part of that is once you get the fundamentals right, you can really start putting in some legwork. And again, the amount of detail that we can go into is kind of I've I've held roles. Um, I held a role as a uh, as a sports scientist, which was my first kind of exposure to sports science in a professional environment, and everything from GPS tracking to repeated testing to internal workload monitoring. It just it's yeah uh, another. I find it so interesting, and this what I'm, the sky is the limit. Uh, some of the rugby players absolutely swear by things like uh, caffeine gum and every th- how intensely you can recover as well and how yeah. fast you can recover. It yeah, the the sky's the limit. It's- I feel like we we one hundred percent need to have you back on uh, <laughs> if you if you if you'd want to. We I I I have personally found it f- very interesting and and this is coming from the side of the fitness. Yes, I have a bit of a love for it already, but to see there's such a gap in this industry that hasn't been tapped and that's where i think i've really sort of drawn into people aren't doing that what why that makes no sense um and you come from such a place of education in your field um so for a quick soundbite if you want to be the top rider in the equestrian industry this is the podcast you need to watch and listen to Right now, there you go. I'll, you can clip that and you can uh, <laughs> use that before it even goes out. <laughs> Sounds good. Anyways, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for Henry for coming yeah, on. Thank you very much, brother. Um, and yeah, we'll be back next week with a new pod. Yeah, we will. We will. I know they may, they may uh, not want it, but again, we'll be back. all available on all streams. And we just don't know what exactly stre- all those streams are, but we're available on all we're of them. We're literally available over at Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Henry, I don't even know anymore. The numbers just keep... <laughs> they're in the tens of thousands on Buzzsprout now, and it's just so hard to keep up with. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Thank you very much, brother. We'll Take see you on the next one. Peace Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, lovely.